Hey, I'm Kosten, and uh, today I would like to present our work on real-time ray tracing of micropoly geometry with a hierarchical level of detail. And this is joint work with Christoph Peters, who actually sits over there and had the original idea. So if you, after the talk, think this method is crap, right, just don't blame me, blame him. Okay, uh, let me start by highlighting uh, the state of the art in terms of handling extreme geometric complexity in real time. And that's Nanite. I mean, Nanite is simply awesome. And as Nanite's approach of hierarchical LOD has been the fundamental inspiration of our work, I would like to provide a quick recap on how Nanite actually works. So, in general, Nanite first partitions the input geometry into small triangle clusters and applies lossy compression to reduce their memory footprint. In our little example here, the input mesh of 16 triangles is subdivided into four clusters with four triangles each. In the next step, Nanite builds a cluster-based hierarchical LOD structure by following a merge and split strategy. In our example here, the four clusters get merged into a new cluster and the geometry gets simplified while preserving the boundary edges. Finally, the simplified cluster gets split into two smaller clusters. So in general, we have four input clusters that will produce two output clusters. And this exactly turns the hierarchy into a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, where a child node, for example, can have multiple parents. So in terms of rendering, Nanai traverses the DAG and essentially performs a cut through it, indicated here by the red line in our example. This cut selects a subset of clusters that fulfill certain view-dependent LOD requirements. And in the next step, the number of clusters in the subset are further reduced by frost and occlusion culling. And finally, the remaining clusters are decompressed and the resulting triangles are processed by a rasterizer. So on average, Nanite roughly rasterizes 20 million triangles per frame. Now, the issue is that Nanite works great with a rasterization-based backend in mind. But it's not really straightforward how to combine the per-frame cluster-based hierarchical LOD selection with hardware-accelerated ray tracing. The problem is that the decompressed cluster geometry needs to be turned very quickly into some form of bottom-level acceleration structure, short blast, that the ray tracing hardware can actually consume. So what are our options here? Option one, forget per-frame LOD. Put a fixed geometry resolution, most likely the highest, into one or more BLSs and reuse those for, all re for rendering all frames. Well, the problem is that the blast memory footprint is significantly less dense than the lossy compressed cluster representation. So one runs out of G uh, GPU memory pretty quickly. Also, modifying the scene, for example, for streaming cluster data will be pretty uh, difficult. And obviously, with a fixed resolution, one ends up with geometric aliasing. And by the way, some form of this option is what Nanite does today. Option two. So we do actually per frame LOD. We traverse the deck, select and decompress clusters, and put the resulting triangles into one or more BLSs and trigger a PLAS rebuild, which in almost all cases internally means a BBH rebuild. Problem is that from frame to frame, different clusters will be selected. So the resulting mesh topology will change, and that will require a full BVH rebuild instead of a BVH refit operation. And unfortunately, today's BVH rebuild performance, even with reduced quality, is not fast enough. And just to give you an example here, let's say you have 20 million triangles and you have a BVH rebuild performance of 400 million triangles, that would still take 50 milliseconds. So that is way too slow for real time. And this is what our approach exactly tackles here. And so uh, let me give you a brief overview of our approach. So similar to Nanite, it consists of two phases, right? A CPU-based preprocessing phase and a per-frame uh, per phase which is exclusively executed on the GPU. In the following, I would like to present uh, a little more details so and starting with the uh, preprocessing phase. So the preprocessing pre phase consists of three steps the initial cluster generation, creating the hierarchy over these clusters, and lossy compression of the cluster data. And all of these steps are quite similar to Nanite, but our, uh, our implementation is a little bit more tailored towards ray tracing. So before we actually generate the clusters, the first step that we do is to convert all triangles of all input meshes into triangle pairs, which we call simply quads from now on. And there are two reasons for doing that. First, for complex 
micropoly geometry, the probability that the neighboring triangles share a common edge and can be turned uh, into a quad is extremely high, so it makes perfect sense to use quad at this point to reduce the memory footprint. Second, well, the ray tracing hardware units of our target GPU architecture actually support triangle pairs at a leaf level, so this is another argument for using quads at this point here. So once we have our list of quads, we build a simple BVH over these. And then we traverse the uh, BVH top down to extract subtrees that have 128 or less quads at the leaf level. And we will turn exactly these subtrees into clusters. The, the reason for using a BVH to extract clusters is that it makes sure that clusters consist of spatial coherent quads, as shown in this example here on the right. This minimizes the bounding box overlap between adjacent clusters, which is beneficial when we later build a BVH over these. Okay, so we have now our list of clusters. The next step is to create, is to create a hierarchy over these. And similar to Nanite, the hierarchy is created by merging clusters. And for identifying pairs of clusters which should be merged, we use a modified iterative bottom-up BVH builder based on the block algorithm. So for a given cluster, the block algorithm, you don't need to know what it exactly does, but it allows us to quickly identify from all adjacent clusters around the current one the one where the area of the bounding box after a potential merge would be the smallest. So it essentially, we are again trying to reduce the overlap between neighboring clusters, which is always beneficial uh, for, uh, for BBH quality. So once selected, the cluster pair is merged into a new cluster, and the underlying geometry is simplified while preserving the boundary edges. So this entire bottom-up merging pr process would create a binary tree, binary tree but unfortunately, cluster merges can fail. And the reason for that is that the number of, qu uh, of quads after simplification can exceed our limit of 128 quads per cluster. And the reason for the insufficient simplification is due to the high number of boundary edges. And in this case, we follow Nanette's approach of splitting the merge cluster again to reduce the number of boundary edges, as shown here in this example. So on the left here, we have two clusters where the shared boundary vertices are marked red. The middle one is the merge cluster, and the right is the simplified merge cluster split in a different manner, and thereby reducing the number of boundary vertices. So essentially, the cluster splitting reduces the probability of failed simplifications higher up in the hierarchy, but at the same time turns the hierarchy from a binary tree representation into a binary DAC representation. But even with cluster splitting, at some point simplification of clusters will no longer be possible, in particular way, way up in the hierarchy. So the remaining unmergeable kind of clusters will become the root nodes of our binary deck. And this is in contrast to a binary tree where you only have one root, right? Here we have multiple uh, roots for the binary deck, but they are also easy to handle. Okay, so the final step of our pre-processing phase is the lossy compression of our clusters. But what data does our cluster actually contain? So our representation is super simple. It's nothing more than a quad mesh plus some metadata. And we therefore apply a very simple lossy compressing scheme. We quantize all vertices with respect to the object's bounding box and using 16 bits per dimension. And for the vertex indices, we use 8 bits. So in other words, a vertex takes 6 bytes, and uh, the four indices of a quad take 4 bytes. So on average, a triangle requires 46 bytes, or in other words, we can put roughly 160 to 220 million uh, triangles into a gigabyte of memory. And as we preserve the boundary edges per cluster and quantize all vertices of an object, and therefore all contained clusters in this object the same way, we preserve water tightness within this particular object. But we cannot pres uh, preserve water tightness across objects because they use different bounding boxes. Okay. So this concludes the uh, pre-processing phase. Now switch over to the per frame phase, which is again exclusively executed on the GPU. It consists of three steps, right? The LOD cluster selection, the cluster decompression in the local cluster BVH build, and the fusing of the cluster BVHs. Okay, in terms of LOD selection, it's pretty straightforward. We do a parallel traverse, top-down traverse of our binary deck, starting from the root nodes, and at each traversal step, we take the bounding box uh, of the cluster, and project it to the image plane, right? And then we take uh, the 2D bounding box of the projection, compute its diagonal, and if this diagonal is less than a 
predefined threshold. In our, in our paper, we use 24 pixels, right? We add this particular cluster to the list of clusters which need to be pre uh, decompressed in the next step. And one important point I would like to make here is that clusters outside of Rustum, right, they cannot be culled because we need them for secondary rays, right? If the rays bounce around, they could potentially touch all clusters. And this is quite um, in contrast to a rasterization-based nanite approach, which aggressively culls these clusters. So what we instead do, we d just assign a coarser LOD level to all clusters outside the view frustum. Okay, and before we look into more detail at the cluster decompression in the per cluster VVH build, a few words on our GPU target uh, architecture, because this will be important for this step. So our target is an Intel Arc GPU, and the underlying ray tracing hardware unit uses a six-wide quantized VVH, which we call simply QVH6 here, as an acceleration structure. So an inner QVH6 node requires 64 bytes and a leaf node uh, because it stores uncompressed triangle pair slash quad data requires 64 bytes as well. And if you wonder why it's a six-wide BVH and not a four-wide or eight-wide, six-wide was, let's say, it, uh, the maximum wideness that we could squeeze into 64 bytes. And uh, one important point here is that the QVH6 represent representation, because it stores uncompressed data, is roughly 5x larger than the lossy compressed cluster representation. So we have a memory expansion when we go from the cluster representation to the QVH6 representation. Okay, so the output of the uh, previous LS, uh, LOD cluster selection step was a list of clusters that contain the right geometry representation for the given frame. Now what we need to do is to decompress each of these clusters and convert them to a QVH6 representation. So here are the exact steps. We load the lossy compressed cluster data, decompress it, but store the resulting quads into shared local memory. Then we trigger a local BVH build process over these quads and store the resulting QBVH6 out to global memory. The important point here is we omitting the bandwidth intensive step of writing out the decompressed quad data first to global memory before building the QVH6. So we, we try to stay as much as possible into shared local memory because this is way faster. So in our little example here, the six clusters on the right, uh, six clusters with six quads on the right here, will be directly converted to the exact QVH6 layout as shown here on the right side. And one interesting fact is that we can really optimize this step pretty intensively. So in terms of performance, we can load the compressed data, decompress it, and write out the QVH6 almost at uh, 75 to 80 percent of a memory copy speed. So basically, this is blazing fast. OK, so this is the final phase of the per, uh, frame GPU phase. So we have all the QB and the cluster QVH6 lying around in global memory, and we just need to kind of connect them together kind of fuse them together into a single QVH6. And we also went for the most simple approach. We simply built a kind of a top-level QVH6 over the cluster QVH6s to connect them. And keep in mind that the number of clusters will be significantly less than the number of quads in the scene. So using a full BVH rebuild is a really a viable option at this point here. Also, a full BVH build makes adding and removing clusters per frame very easy. So for example, uh, makes uh, streaming kind of trivial. Okay, let's uh, have a quick look at results here. Um, as mentioned before, I use an in Intel Arc here with 16 GB of memory as GPU target. In terms of software, we integrated everything into a modified version of Empri 4.0. And the main reason for doing that is that Empri is open source and we can modify as we want, right? So, um, we, and therefore we can kind of bypass the current DXR and Vulkan API restrictions. So what we simply did is we added another primitive type to Empri, uh, and this is our lossy compressed clusters. Okay, so this here is a little example. It's a 200 million triangle example scene running, running at full HD resolution with four samples per pixel at around 60 frames per second. The right side uh <coughs> shows the tessellation, and we got closer. Uh, the tessellation changes from a lower to higher resolution. And now the right side actually shows the actual clusters, and the change in color means we use a different cluster for this particular part of the geometry. And here is an LOD visualization, and the brighter the red, the finer the LOD level. Again, when zooming into the darker parts, they become brighter as a finer LOD level and a higher geometry resolution is used. <coughs> 
and we are obviously not limited to primary visibility. This is pathing plus denoising, right? With one simple per pixel, denoising adds roughly 10 millisecond overhead, and it runs at 20 frames. And this is just a larger scene with roughly half a billion triangles, and also with you stay at around uh, hard to read uh, 20 something frames per second. Okay, uh, let's have a more detailed look at the actual per frame cost. Again, the per frame GPU phase consists of the LOD selection, the cluster decompression, the local cluster BBH build, and the third uh, step is the fusing of the clusters. And if you look at these numbers, they are all very fast, with the second being the most costly one. And if you add them up, right, you get roughly a per frame overhead of 5.7 to 9 milliseconds, which is kind of okayish for real time. Um, applications. So one important point here is that the second and third step actually build a full BVH over the triangle slash quartz contained in the selected clusters per frame. Now, if one adds the cost of these two together and computes the BVH build performance and compares it to building a BVH over the individual quartz uh, without leveraging the cluster hierarchy, one gets an order of magnitude improvement. Right? And this is quite significant and is the essential reason why our per frame LOD selection approach actually works really well. And we can make use of this. Right? We can actually support fully dynamic content. Here we have 50k B spline and Gregory patches that for each frame get on the fly tessellated based on the current LOD settings. And the tessellation results are directly converted in our lossy compressed cluster format and stored out to global memory. And that, from that point on, it's the same procedure as before. The clusters get decompressed, the, clusters, uh, the cluster BVHs get built, and finally fused together. And the BVH build process does not know anything about that the clusters ha has been uh, on the fly generated. And here everything runs at roughly 60 frames per second at full HD resolution with four samples per pixel. Okay, so let me quickly conclude. Uh, Cluster-based plus construction slash BVH construction is extremely fast. Why it is so fast? And the reason for that, it's another incarnation of a build from hierarchy, right? And Warren Hand had a famous paper almost a decade ago and built from hierarchy. And uh, it's basically the essential ingredient why you get a 10x speed up here, right? You have to kind of restrict uh, the BVH build first to a, a local partitioning of, of the scene, the clusters, right? And then you fu fuse the cluster BVHs together. And if you do that, you're way, way, way faster than doing a standard BVH build of all the individual triangles. Awkward. Okay. And with that, we're getting really close to real-time hierarchical level of detail with hardware accelerated ray tracing, right? We have an overhead of five to nine milliseconds, which is honestly a little bit too much for games, right? But obviously the code could could get optimized and faster hardware, yada, yada, right? So we are getting close there, right? There is basic light at the end of the tunnel. And one important th thing I would like to mention is that in terms of complex micropoly geometry, we should not deal with individual triangles or quads, right? We should use a coarser granularity. And I think something like a lossy compressed cluster mesh should be a new primitive that everyone should use. Okay, uh, quickly in terms of future work, um, I uh, mean, it's pretty obvious. Our lossy, compressed, uh, lossy compression scheme is probably not that advanced, right? So something better, uh, we should use something better, something like delta encoding with prediction or something like hierarchical encoding, right? And the same goes also for the hardware-supported um <coughs> geometry representation in the blast, right? But one important point I would like to make here is that these two don't have to be the same, right? As we've shown today, we can convert from one to the other on the fly per frame. And as I mentioned before, the, um, we should kind of standardize the lossy compressed cluster mesh primitive, uh, primitive type to make it vendor agnostic. So this means adding some special DXR Vulkan API extension. Okay, and with that, I'm happy to take your questions. Thanks for the great talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Right. Oh, I need to throw. Give me a sec. Uh, I'll just check. I'm pretty on the online. Um, for the online people, we need. Okay, I'll, I'll not throw. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, you have a microphone anyway. I, I did have a microphone. Yes, true. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, really nice talk. Thank you. Um, uh, uh, is there, would there be any benefit at all using refitting at any point? Is there any way that could help? Uh, refitting is a little bit 
tricky due to uh, the binary deck nat nature. I mean, if you would have a binary tree, this would be way easier. With the binary deck, it gets a little bit more tricky. It's doable, but it's probably more kind of future work. Okay. But your BVH repel performance, let's say, if you do it over the clusters, is so fast. I can go back there. I'm sorry, one or two milliseconds. And this is kind of almost unoptimized code. So, okay. so it's, it's not really the bottleneck. OK, thank you. For the dynamic geometry, yeah. uh, to keep things performant, did you need to have uh, same topology? Like, if the topology changes, does the clustering change in a way that, that lowers performance? Or um, so the the base geometry of the dynamic example that I've, that I've shown here are basically B-spine patches and Gregory patches, and they just get evaluated based on certain LOD distance from the UR, right, uh, projecting the bounding box on the image plane, right? Then you the selected tessellation level, or the evaluation level, and based on that, you get your tessellation, right? Uh, and then you convert this to the lossy compressed cluster format. And your question was whether this uh, impacts performance? Uh, I guess in a, in a more typical scenario where you start with high resolution triangles and you want to do this kind of clustering, okay. uh, if you change topology, does that would that have any effect on the the performance of the clustering? Of the, ah, of the initial. Um, so in general, uh, as always for ray tracing, uh, it's, um, you should avoid long diagonal, let's say, triangles. So if you change the topology in such a way that you get these kind of artificial kind of uh, triangles, that is bad for BBH quality, right? So, uh, but in general, if you deal with micropoly geometry where your tessellation is roughly the same, I don't think that changing, let's say, the connection between the versions does anything to the BBH quality. I don't think so. If this answers your question. Or we can take it up, yeah, maybe enough. I can the ask you off Okay. Off. Are there any more questions? Right, so as assuming you would get uh, hardware support for the quantized BVH, do you think there's still room for rasterization? Room for rasterization? Yeah, uh, rasterization won't go anywhere anytime soon, to be honest. I mean, th there is 20, 30, 40 years of legacy, right? No way, right? But there's, I guess, is a little bit, my personal opinion, um, there's a slow shift towards ray tracing going over the years, right? It's not as fast as for the, let's say, the, the movie and uh, special effects industry where it happened within 10 years. For the game stuff, it will probably take a little bit longer. But it's just my personal take on it. And uh, regarding the differences of, uh, of Nanite, is it just works so much better for rasterization? Is it not a good fit for, for ray tracing, what do you think? Because all of the overhead for the, the BH building? Yeah, or is the there some uh, other secret uh, sauce going on in, the, in Nanite? Hmm. That's, a, that's a good point. So I don't think that the initial clustering has been really optimized in Nanite for ray tracing, right? Because it, it's, it's kind of how you group your triangles or quads together. If they take a lot of space, right, this would be bad uh, for ray tracing because the bounding boxes would overlap between neighboring uh, clusters, right? So I don't think that the Nanite guys paid that much attention because it doesn't really matter from a rasterization-based approach. Right, this would be my take. But Christopher? So yeah, I can add a bit to that. Um, the nanite mesh preprocessing is very focused on the topology of the geometry. Um, so, as you said, it doesn't really care about bounding boxes. Uh, so, that's basically the key motivation why we did it differently. But with that said, I'm honestly not sure if um, it might actually get better if you would do exactly what nanite does. Um, I mean, we did not want to somehow integrate this into Unreal Engine because it's just a huge code base to work with. Um, so we did something from scratch and doing it based on clock was the more straightforward option. But yeah, Nanite preprocessing may still work better with this in spite of not caring about bounding boxes. Thank you. So there's no further questions. Then let's thank the authors again. It's a great paper. <laughs>